When people meet me, generally they are curious to know what it takes to be a police officer, what are the challenges, are these challenges any different for a woman top cop in a predominantly male-dominated police force, and so on. In the next 16 minutes, I will unravel some of these challenges, if not all. When people enter the Indian Police Service, the IPS, they are starry-eyed and they have Singham-like idealism in mind. But as days roll by and they become part of the system, their idealism wakes and wanes. And the first sign of this is when the officer begins to think in terms of what his political boss wants rather than what the law demands. My first rendezvous with a politician was way back in August 2004. I was in my first independent charge as the police head of any district. I was posted in Dharwad district. I was just a month old in that post. The local court had issued a non-bailable warrant against the then Chief Minister of Madhya Pradesh. Executing non-bailable warrant meant arresting her. Eventually, this incident led her to resign from the post of Chief Minister. But for me, trust me, though this incident involved a person as high profile as the Chief Minister of a state, this has been the easiest challenge till date. In India, we have a deep-rooted menace of VIP culture. The VIPs, particularly the politicians, are given special treatment of various kinds, one such being policemen given as gunmen to politicians. Now, in most of the situations, most of the cases, even when there is no real threat, even when there is no specific threat, Gunmen are given as status symbols. And the more the gunmen, the higher the status it is perceived. And it's not an exaggeration at all that many a time, most of these gunmen are used as boys to run Iran's. I was posted as the Deputy Commissioner of Police, Bengaluru City Armed Reserve, and my job was to supervise man management, personnel deployment, and therefore, I took stock of the situation as to where my boys had been deployed. And to my utter shock, I found that a number of politicians, the public representatives, the MLAs, MPs, MLCs, and so on, had kept gunmen in excess of the authorized number they were supposed to keep. Now, I made a list. There were 82 politicians who had kept about 216 gunmen in excess of the number they were entitled. I started withdrawing them. The first resistance came from my own boss, who reprimanded me in front of my subordinate officers. Yet, undeterred, I completed the task. I withdrew till the last excess gunman came back to the unit. In the same stroke, I also removed, withdrew, eight brand new SUVs kept by the then ex-Chief Minister of Karnataka. The man had stepped down from the post of Chief Minister, yet the vehicles had continued to be with him. I withdrew the vehicles, but I often wondered why my predecessors had not acted. What prevented them from setting things right? I later learned that these are called the dirty jobs. They are unpleasant tasks inviting the wrath of the politicians, and nobody wants to do them. Not very long ago, I was posted as a DIG Prisons, Bengaluru. I was there in that post for barely 17 working days, barring all the Sundays and holidays. And during that time, I witnessed similar special treatment being given to a convict. This convict was very powerful. She had been the close aide of the ex-Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu, who died recently. The convict herself was slated to be the Chief Minister some time ago in that state. Now, the Supreme Court had convicted her under Corruption Act for possessing disproportionate assets beyond her known sources of income. Flouting the Honorable Supreme Court's orders, the jail officials had given special facilities to her as quid pro quo. So I reported this irregularity, and soon after this report, 
a number of people asked me, was your act a well thought out one or something done at the spur of the moment? Frankly speaking, I did not think of the consequences. There was no need to, because I was clear in my mind that I had acted in a manner most transparent and accountable, which every public servant is expected to. Now, after this report, I was slapped a defamation suit notice. So what is the take home? If you stir hornet's nest, be prepared for all kinds of oddities and notices. In a similar such instance, 11 years ago, I received a similar notice, but that time it was privilege motion notice by a legislator. In 2006, I was posted as the district police head of Bidar district. There were riots in a taluka of Bidar district called Humnabad. There were prima, prima facie reports that the local member of legislative council, MLC, had incited the riots. And therefore, I gave a go ahead to the station house officer of the police station to register case against the MLC and to take further action. No sooner than I did this, not only was I transferred, but that apart, privilege motion notice was slapped on me. Now the law is very clear, rules are very clear. If a public representative is booked or named in the FIR as accused, be it the MLA or MLC or MP, he cannot claim it as his privilege. There can't be any privilege motion against the person who does it. Yet, unjustifiably, I was slapped the notice, I was made to appear before the privilege committee of the state legislature a number of times, and it dragged on for several years. Yes. And now, what is the take home? What is the lesson that the politician is driving home in this? He is trying to teach the lesson to a bureaucrat. If you take me head on, this is what is going to be meted out to you. He is creating a fear psychosis in the mind of not just that particular individual bureaucrat, but in the whole clan of bureaucrats. And if the bureaucrat gets scared and succumbs, the politician succeeds in his purpose. Trust me, not many officers are willing to face such notices because for acts done in official capacity, these kind of notices create a lot of personal discomfiture. They take away personal time, energy, peace of mind, and of course money if you have to fight it out in the court of law and therefore nobody wants to face them. But in my personal opinion, just like every occupation has its own occupational hazards, these notices, be it the privilege notice or the contempt notice or, the, um, or any other kind of notice, defamation notice, whichever, they are the occupational hazards which have to be faced boldly by the bureaucrat. Now, coming to the challenges that I faced as a woman in male-dominated police force, the peril is that the woman officer could be ignored, taken for granted, taken lightly. Her instructions can be thrown to air at times. I had one such shocking experience in Gadag district. In 2008, I was heading Gadag district police force. In March 2008, in Nargund Taluka of Gadag district, there was a powerful politician who had been a minister earlier he addressed his, a gathering of his followers and made an inciting speech that made his followers to set a blaze on fire three government buses soon after his speech. Now, government buses mean public property, bought out of taxpayers' money. I instructed my subordinate, the second in command of the rank of DYSP, to arrest the politician as he was prima facie guilty of abetment of the offense, and there was videographed evidence of his speech. Now, to my utter shock, not only my subordinate resisted, refused, but also kept on arguing relentlessly and kept lying to me that the politician had already left the town. I too did not budge. I had reached the police station in the morning, and I kept sitting throughout the day 
So it became evening, it became night, the clock struck 9 at night, 9.15, 9.30, 10. And finally when the police staff saw that I'm not budging out, they somehow managed to get the politician to the police station. And then I instructed the station house officer of the police station to carry on the arrest procedures legally and to hand him over to the judicial custody, which was carried out. Now, upon the subordinate who had been kept, who had been lying to me, I took upon an inquiry and found that he was in constant touch with that politician over phone, though he had been lying to me that he was nowhere to be found. To this effect, I sent a report against the subordinate, the DSP, to the government as well as the election Commission of India, because by that time election machinery was in place, and the government suspended him, and he remained in suspension for more than a year. Now, the challenges could be of very different kinds. Yadgiri was created as the newest district of Karnataka, and I was the first police head of the district. There were teething problems let alone there being no office building, let alone there being no official residential quarter, there was not even striking force. So if there is a law and order problem or peace disturbance, what does one do without striking force? Hence, I adopted a strategy. In the initial few days, even in the smallest of the smallest instances of peace disturbance, I took strictest action without any leniency against the lawbreakers and that sent down a message that if you take law into your hands, you will not be spared. And this worked wonders. My next three years of Yadgiri tenure were quite peaceful. But Yadgiri posting posed different challenges even to my family members. As I said, there was no official residential quarter there was not even a private one available. But incidentally, my husband had an additional post. He was in charge of that additional post in that district, and that post had an official quarter. But that residence was in a village, and the village was called Bhimra and Gudi. I started staying there, and very next to the residence was a school. My daughter literally started her formal education in that village school. She sat on the floor as there were no benches and she completed three years of her education there in a school with no facilities whatsoever, including a toilet. Now, not many police officers, IPS officers, like to work in such places which are called backward, nondescript, remote, and in what, in their own words, they would call lacking in life. And in such a place, I spent more than three years of my service including the period of my prime youth there. So challenges, therefore, are manifold. Yet, if the officer is willing to take risks, if the officer has nothing to hide, if he is clear in mind that he has acted lawfully and is fair, if he does not cling on to politicians for perks, cushy postings, and so on, and last but not the least, if he has kept his bags packed ready to move out any time if transferred, then such an officer, he or she, becomes a force to reckon with. After taking head on the mighty and powerful on several occasions, if I'm alive and kicking and able to deliver a TED talk before you all, you can imagine the robust protection under law available to the bureaucrats for acts done in official capacity. And therefore, I find many of the fears of bureaucrats to be unfounded and baseless. Now, you might see that you, there is, it's a commonplace knowledge that the MLAs, the MPs, the MLCs, these posts are created under the Constitution of India, but one must not forget that it is under the same constitution, the All India Services, the IAS, the IPS are created. And Article 311 of the constitution gives complete protection to the bureaucrats, 
for acts done in official capacity and it is available to every officer in the country, including the state services. So the day the bureaucrats are able to come out of the phobia of transfers, the phobia of politicians, we will have the best bureaucracy in the world. Karl Marx once said, bureaucracy is an iron cage. But I find that our bureaucrats have chained themselves. They are the ones holding the chains. The day they break away from these self-imposed chains, the day they start exercising their real powers, we will see a new India. Thank you.